there. I'm Paul Glumas, and today is the 1st of May, May Day, and uh, this is being brought to you by General Welfare Presents. What I have to report, um, what I have to say is uh, not possible for me to say or communicate the profound nature of what has happened this last weekend. In Beijing, China, the weekend before, the, the 27th to 28th, 26th, 27th, 28th, uh, you had the second Belt and Road Conference in Beijing. The first one was two years before. Now, the second Belt and Road Conference, there were 37 heads of state. Something like a hundred, hundreds of cabinet officials. I mean, in the hundreds, cabinet officials. There were thousands and thousands of business people. There were over 5,000 people there as delegates, as, as uh, attending the conference from all over the world. And what, is ha what happened at that conference is that you had enough heads of state, enough cabinet officials, enough bus very prominent business people from all over the world Enough activity is going on in the in the six years that the Belt and Road has been um, occurring that there was a transformation at the conference in terms of it being just a conference you go to because the Chinese are doing all of this stuff to this is the direction of the human species for the next 50 years. This is the direction of the relationship between nations, governing nations over the next 20 years. That relationship is an economic relationship of a shared future in the development of the planet. And that is the, that's reality. That's the overwhelming new reality that's coming in and is being knitted together by organic relationships by organic relationships not by rule of law per se not by treaty agreements per se not by the rules based order and the way this works and from the Chinese standpoint is you do not want to have a fixed treaty with a poor country you're going to help develop the infrastructure in because a thousand things can happen so, so that the treaty obligations cannot, can't, can't be fixed or rigid. It has to be flexible. So what the Chinese got, uh, do is they set up a memorandum of understanding where that nation signs a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese government, which is not a binding document which is not a treaty, but it establishes the principles of the relationship. And the government that signs it with the Chinese essentially is saying, we agree with these principles. We agree that this is what we want. We agree that this, these are the direction and, this, and, with, and with these are the projects we want to support and, and, and cooperate in creating. With, and the Chinese do the same. And then the institutions get to work, the private sector gets to work, business contracts and trade, trade occurs, and business contracts occur, but there's no treaty saying, you know, you are, these are the rules as such. These are like the rules that you have to follow. Uh, it, it, I mean, the general thing is laid out in the in the memorandum of understanding, and 
and it's not this specific treaty we're going to lend you so much money and you're going to pay it back in such and such a time and blah 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 you know none of that yeah we we agree that that's the time frame you want to we want to you know uh we, well, okay we we want to have this loan out functioning for a long time you know if you can't pay the interest okay fine you know we'll, but the thing is to get the the production going to get the construction going to get people paid to get people uh you know to get goods in and out and so forth and so on so that's a very different way of doing business okay and um so this belt and road is now the future it is now established and this is lyndon larouche this is his concept worked in part through his wife helga zepp larouche who the chinese refer to as the new silk road lady this is the combination of work began in the late 1980s when it became obvious that the Soviet Union would disintegrate. This has been the project. That's 30 years of organizing. Organizing from prison, where LaRouche was in prison uh, as well, and Helga and organizing and, 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 and putting it all together. And so this has now happened. And this is now the new, uh, the new framework for humanity to, to function in. This economic, global economic development. There are 20 corridors, major corridors. Uh, there are ports. Uh, there's oceans. And none of this is being reported to the American public. The world has just gone through as going into a massive change of incredible proportions, which is going to direct the human race for the next 50 years. And there's nothing about it in the US media. Now, what is in the US media is a stepped up hyper demonization of China as the enemy, China as the communist menace, China as the yellow pearl, China is going to dominate the world, China is uh, putting the world under its control through debt traps, China is, and so and this is taking off. Um, it's really getting, it's taking off in Canada really bad, but here it's very bad. And inside the, the Trump administration, there are three major prattlers to this uh, demonization of China. And they're very prominent people in the, in, in the uh, administration. One of them is the vice president, Mike Pence. The other is the secretary of state. Pompeo, and the other is the uh, National Security Advisor, John Bolton. And they are working furiously to undermine this. Furiously. And there's no way they can do it. It's too late. It's taking over. The only possible way they can create a situation which would wreck the United States partic ultimate participation in the Belt and Road and create a period of warfare is if they can trick or manage to get Donald Trump to bite on Taiwan, the South Sea Islands controversy, Iran, and Venezuela. If they could get Trump to commit troops to overthrow Venezuela or, six, or, or do a military action to blockade uh, Iran's oil exports to China and India and Turkey, 
because I don't think those countries are going to are, are, are going to you know just not buy Iranian oil because the uh, the, the what they call the um, the exemptions have run out today today the exemptions are supposed to run out so or increasing the sanctions on North Korea to try to wreck the North Korean situation whatever Bolton they have one objection and that object and that is to stop uh, 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 the process and the possibility of the US joining the Belt and Road but instead going to war against Russia and China that is where those guys are coming from and that is very clear and you just saw if you were watching the most incredible spectacle uh, reminiscent of that old movie wag the dog from way back where they provoked a war by staging something in a studio this is what sort of happened in Venezuela <laughs> uh, there's this rich suburb there's this rich neighborhood in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, called Altamira, where all the white look, very white-looking, Spaniard-looking, rich people live, and and they and they are, you know, uh, they were mobilized to make it look like there was a coup going on against the government of Venezuela, a military coup, and you had this guy. This 35-year-old rich playboy, Jean uh, Guaido, standing there with a bunch of people in military uniforms talking about a military coup. And then you have U.S. propaganda pumping in, saying, there are defections coming in the, from the Venezuelan military, and, and, and Maduro uh, was about to get on a plane to Cuba to get away from uh, the coup. And on and on and all this stuff, and this is coming directly from tweets from from Pompeo and so forth and so on, and it's total horseshit. Okay, the whole thing was just horseshit. Total. There was no military uprising. There was no military involved. And then at at the end of the day, John Guido admits, "Well, it was not a it was not a military thing. It was it's a peaceful uh, insurrection of the people." Yeah, all these rich people in Altamira, you know, are all banging their pots, right? And you know, and and you look at the death figures. They're not. Very, I didn't hear any death figures. Nobody screaming that somebody died because they got shot by the by the government. And they're not even arresting this guy. He's supposed to be leading a, a, a coup against the government, and they didn't even arrest him. What kind? You know, it's totally manufactured but why did they do that why did they do something so obviously stupid so obviously impotent I mean we're supposed to be the most powerful country in the world and and we we haven't been able to pull off a coup you know we haven't been able to come up with enough dollars to buy enough generals to pull off a coup what's going on here you know we almost succeeded in Turkey but we did it and now, we couldn't do it in Venezuela. Turkey's a much more powerful country than Venezuela. You know? So, this is really like, like, uh, you know, this is really like looking bad, okay? From the, from the standpoint of, you know, we're the tough guy on the block. We have 800 military bases all over the world. You know, we can strike, strike your country down from the air, you know? rain death upon you like we did in Serbia and Kosovo you know like we did in uh, Libya we can rain death upon you if you do not obey the international you know rule rules based order or whatever only it's a, it, there's been a slight change um, those countries now have Russian air defense systems and that kind of changed things because you don't have air power you don't have unrestricted control of the air anymore because the Russians have developed an air defense system and they have sold it to a lot of these countries that would otherwise come under attack so now the US military is saying uh, look uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna just if we go in with the air power we're gonna have 
some problems, we're going to have casualties, it's going to be serious, you know, we're going to lose so many planes, or, uh, so many pilots, and then, you know, we're not going to be able to do the job, and then, we, you know, we got to go in by ground, and that's kind of messy, and do we want to really do that? Pompeo says yes, Bolton say yes, and Trump is probably saying no. Trump is saying no. But why is this happening? Because we're on the eve of something very potentially spectacular. The Belt and Road Summit has occurred. It was huge. The U.S.-China trade agreement is probably going to be more than a trade agreement. And here's the little something in the corner of your eye that makes you wonder The, the statistics for the rise of GDP in the United States shocked everybody. The, the upper, upper most optimistic figure was going to be somewhere around 2% for the first quarter. That's the rate. It came out over 3%. And people were shocked. And they couldn't figure out why there was this rise in GDP. And they looked at the consumer. No, it's not because people are consuming more. They're looking at all these other things. And what they realize, what they have come to realize, is that it's the increase of U.S. exports, primarily to China. So over this period of negotiations, on the trade deal, the Chinese have been buying a lot more American goods, like enough to put one or more percent increase in the GDP of the United States. So the natural question is, was that part of what was going on in the trade deal? Did, did China make these decisions to buy all these American goods? Under, on, uh, so what's going on here? Once the trade deal is signed, or is about to be signed, it is expected that Xi Jinping will come to the White House and do the signing there. I'm not saying that that's exactly what's going to happen, but that's what's, being, that's what's going around. And the visit of Xi Jinping is going to be a very profound experience for Americans. Because he has, to my knowledge, not um, visited the White House. He's visited Mar-a-Lago, but... He, he has not visited the White House. And so this is going to be a very profound experience. And it's in that environment which the beginning of a, of, of a relationship between the United States and China will, will be established that will be absolutely potentially determining for the world. And that's what, uh, that's what is very important. Now, what is going to be in this trade agreement? Is this trade agreement actually bringing the United States into co-participation with China in the global economic development of the Belt and Road, in which case U.S. has increasing markets for exports, not just to China, but all over the world in the conjunction of the growth, massive growth and development that will occur in Africa and Latin America and Asia and everywhere else like that. Think about that for a second. Is that what this trade agreement is about? That's a good question. Perhaps because of all the fury in which the British are now mobilizing everything they have internationally to try to wreck this process. If you go by that, you must assume that something big is going on that is not being discussed. But when you have this caper in Venezuela and you have this attack on Iran and you have this attempt to sabotage the North Korean summit and you have all of this going on by the establishment and the cabinet and Trump is not participating in that, then you have to ask yourself something big is going on.
to try to wreck it. Then something else happened yesterday. Donald Trump went to the Senate and the, went to Congress to meet with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. You know, and they had a meeting. And according to them, Trump was very pleasant and very nice and very non-confrontational and all of that. And, you know, he didn't. And the figure that they came up with for infrastructure was $2 trillion. Where's the money going to come from? Is it going to come from Wall Street? Well, they're not going to give you any money unless they can take a lot of money out. Not in 20 years or 30 years is what you need for a long-term infrastructure project. But like, we put in a dollar, we take out two. It's called PPP, you know, partnership, uh, private-public partnership, PPP. And it's a real PPP, let me tell you. And um, so that, Trump's not saying it's PPP, and, and he's not saying it's anything. He said, well, I am going to take responsibility to make sure that we, we find a way. What does that mean? And then you have China saying on record in a number of different places that, hey, we can help. We got a trillion dollars of, uh, or more of, of dollar of dollar holdings. Yeah, why not? Why not put them to work? Where they where they going to do the most good in building U.S. infrastructure? Oh, by the way, we have developed a, a cheap way to build high speed rail. Maybe we can help, you know, you with your high speed rail programs. Why not? Oh no, we can't have that. That's imperialism. That's Chinese imperialism. Well, the British buy up your property. The Chinese build your infrastructure. What you prefer? Which do you prefer? Real estate speculation or infrastructure? So, <laughs> so now that's that's the fundamental question. That's the fundamental question. Now, on the LaRouche Pack website, there is a class given last Saturday by Helga Zepp LaRouche. I encourage everyone to minimally watch the first 15 minutes. It's going to shock you. In that 15 minutes, there's a short presentation by Helga Zeplarouche, and then there is a five-minute video from 1997 of Lyndon LaRouche discussing all these projects and the fact that he was involved in discussing them with the Clinton administration, with Clinton and China. And he was trying to bring China and the U.S. together on what is now the Belt and Road. 1997. It'll shock you. That clip could have been played today from 22 years ago. And I encourage everybody to watch that, which brings up the issue of the need to exonerate Lyndon LaRouche. And exoneration means exposing and going after the frame-up of LaRouche. Establishing that this frame-up occurred and that because of that frame-up and the vilification of LaRouche, his ideas are not now available to the American public in the way they should be. And this is absolutely crucial that this be uh, addressed. And there will be a memorial for LaRouche on June the 8th in Manhattan. Uh, there will be satellite observances and a pamphlet is being put out 
that go, goes back to the framing up of Lyndon LaRouche, that goes, that goes to the framing up of Donald Trump, that goes to the networks involved. And this is very important, to ultimately break the environment so that the, there can be a discussion about how LaRouche was framed up, from which you can get an exoneration. And from that, you can liberate the, the, the profound ideas that Lyndon LaRouche has presented to the world. In, in, in the economics and science and culture, and that is uh, that is what we're we we have to do because the banning of certain people's works, the banning of certain ideas, have had a very negative influence on history. Plato was lost for twenty. Plato and Socrates were lost by seventeen hundred years. It was not revived until the European Renaissance. Kepler's works were banned for hundreds of years. Shakespeare was banned for uh, 150 years. People did not have access to Shakespeare for well over 150 years after his death. Uh, this shapes a culture, this shapes a society. Uh, Nicholas of Cusa was banned as well. Leibniz has been written out completely. And Leibniz was the inspiration for Lyndon LaRouche. Leibniz was the was the concept was the founder of science of, of the idea of technology industrial and the Industrial Revolution. And yet after he died, he was written out as as a as a as a, as pretty much not banned but 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 not not relevant and it is it is precisely for that reason that we must exonerate Lyndon LaRouche so that those ideas that have already shaped the next are already shaping the next 50 years can be much more uh, uh, active in informing uh, the next 50 years <laughs>